Welcome to the Mark Matusik Media Podcast Series. On this podcast, Mark talks with Mary O'Malley. Mary O'Malley is an author, teacher, and counselor whose work awakens others to what she calls the joy of being fully alive. Known for her plain spoken clarity and deep seated wisdom, Mary has been sharing her vision with students for the past 40 years and is widely acknowledged as an important voice in the world of spiritual development. Eckhart Tolle thanked Mary for her contribution to the evolution of human consciousness. Mark talked to this Washington based teacher about her latest book, What's in the Way is the Way, and the journey that Mary has taken to where she is today. Now, here's Mark. Welcome, Mary. Thank you so much for doing this interview with me. Oh, I'm so glad to be with you, Mark. Thanks so much. So I wanted to start out by asking you about your own awakening. What is it that brought you to the spiritual path, and how did your own conversion, for want of a better word, actually happen? Well, I I think the first piece of it is that I was gifted with great darkness, and I almost died of it, you know, in my early 20s and uh, tried absolutely everything to get out of that place of darkness. You know, psychologists, psychiatrists, mental hospitals, drugs, prescription drugs, hypnotherapy, you name it. Mm. And then when none of that worked, I tried suicide and even hated myself for being a failure at suicide because I tried it for three times. Wow. May may I ask, what was the source of this darkness in you? What was your turmoil? uh, I had a childhood I don't think you would wish on anybody. (laughs) Can you say say more? Well, it it is all uh, many, many levels of abuse. And, you know, too long to really get into it, but really withdrew at a very young age and was uh, extremely shy, very, very self-contained and became more and more isolated, you know, over the years. And then when I went away to college, I discovered the joys of alcohol. And uh, before that, I had discovered the joys of overeating. And I once gained 97 pounds in a year. And uh, all of this was to get away from the unmet pain. Mm -hmm. Thank God I wasn't successful at suicide because when I was 27... Uh, I went to a Hatha Yoga weekend, but this man also taught Yana Yoga, and I could not tell you what happened in that room. All I could tell you was that my life changed from like a a B-grade, black and white, grainy horror movie to a Dolby surround sound Technicolor Panavision movie, and yet I, I, I couldn't grasp it. All I knew was that he was speaking the truth, and then he would come up from California like once every nine months, and third time he came up, I recorded it, and then transcribed the whole thing, and that book, oh my God, that book was my talisman, and then my store and house burnt to the ground. Grief, I lost everything. What happened? My house and store burnt to the ground. Wow. And I, everything but what I grieved was that book. So the next time he came, I said, I want to tell you what I am hearing you say, and I want you to tell me if I am on the right track. And he said, yes. And there were two parts of it. I said, the first is, in the seeing is the movement. And his eyes just twinkled. Because... We all try to fix and change and rearrange and understand and rise above and get rid of. That's what I've been doing my whole life. And it never brought me the peace I wanted. He gave me the first glimmering of the power of our attention to heal. Mm. And so then I said, the whole sentence is, in the seeing is the movement until the observer and the observed become one. In other words, until you come back fully into this flow of life. But it wasn't until I had the wonderful grace to meet and spend a fair amount of time with a man called Stephen Levine, who has written many books on death and dying, but really they were all about being fully alive. And he taught me the other core aspect of consciousness. 
first aspect is the ability to see what is right now. See thoughts, see feelings, see sensations, see the dewdrops, see the clouds. The other aspect is the heart, the spaciousness that allows it to be there. Mm. And out of that started coming, you know, all this teaching and all this traveling and all of these books. And I am just so grateful that I am allowed to serve life in this way. No, it's such a beautiful thing. Oh, tell me, tell me, was, was, it's not as if the shadow immediately and permanently oh, li- no. lifted yeah. for you, right? So, yeah. so it was an ongoing process of, yeah. of awakening. Absolutely. Yes. Yes. The way I described it uh, sometimes is that I lived in this black, black, pulsing, dark ball. And when I went into that room and he started speaking, when that Hatha Yoga weekend, when I was 27, I stepped out of the ball. Of course, I went right back into it. Mm-hmm. But I didn't know the aspect of the heart, so I judged myself. Now you see this, and now you're back in here. What is wrong with you? Mm-hmm. So I struggled with that for many years until I met Stephen. And without even noticing it, Mark, I began to realize that over the years since I started awakening, I lived in the ball, I would step out of it, then I would go back into the ball. But then, all of a sudden, I realized I lived outside of the ball. I would go and visit it. You know, something would happen, and this whole fear-based mind that's glued together with judgment would wake up and drag me around. But then very quickly, I would wake up in the ball and say, okay, who's here? What, what, what is happening right now? And then, of course, the two aspects of consciousness would begin to come on board, curiosity and compassion, or I like the word spaciousness. Mm. Stephen calls one of his books a gradual awakening. And there's so many of us that, you know, in fact, Eckhart stayed with me many years ago when, before, uh, you know, he was really well known. And I was joking with him saying, you know, I want to wake up like you do, did, <laughs> you know, just bam, it's all gone. And he said, oh, Mary, very, very few people will wake up in that way, you know, that it is a process. And, uh, and then in the end, it's not even a process. Mm-hmm. You just come back life. Beautiful. How long was it, by the way, between uh, the Hatha Yoga teacher and meeting Stephen? Eleven years. Ah. So Eleven you... years. You know, and, and I got, you know, a fair amount of spaciousness during that time, but I kept on being caught back into the judging quality of the mind. I call this the storyteller in our head, this unconscious self. And I say that it's made out of fear and glued together with judgment. I could now relate to fear, not fully, but judgment would hook me and take me on a merry chase. I love to say that my judger uh, went to law school and graduated top in his class and was president of the debate club. (laughs) (laughs) He could convince me of anything. And when I met Stephen... Then I began to do what I call look to unhook. And slowly and surely, the judger is now in my heart. It has no power over me. Every once in a while, it will wake up. But it goes straight to my heart. Wow. Do you find yourself still dealing with difficult emotions? Oh, of course. We used to think. Well, I, at least when I was awakening in the 60s, you know, when I was originally waking, you know, I was going to nirvana. I was leaving all of this behind, and I was going to live in unending bliss, you know. And slowly and surely, you begin to discover, this is not about getting rid of anything. This is about discovering the space that thoughts, feelings, sensations, and what I like to call spells, because that's a lot of what the storyteller is made up of is spells, that it's discovering the spaciousness that all of that is happening in. So you put me in the right situation. I had a very close family member 
almost died and was in the ICU last March for uh, six days and in the hospital for 13. And sitting there in that ICU, all sorts of states came. Mm-hmm. So it takes a it, it takes a pretty big challenge to wake up these really deep places of fear and despair and shame and so on and so forth. But uh, I didn't really get caught. I would start moving into them, identifying with them, and uh, I love to say become a tightness detective. Because the more you open to life, the more alert you are when the spells come. Mm. Because they tighten you. They tighten your body, they tighten your heart, they tighten your mind. And so I had a long six-day meditation retreat in the ICU at the hospital of states coming and tightening down and then that waking me up and seeing it and then they just pass through. Mm. Mm. Beautiful. So let, let me backtrack just a bit, Mary. Did, did you have any kind of a spiritual upbringing or a religious mm, a foundation no. that this came out of? No. Mm-mm. Is there a religion that you, uh, that you uh, identify with today? Not really. We did go, uh, uh, our family did go sporadically to Unity Church which uh, is not the Unitarian, but this is the Unity Church that uh, believes that Jesus' core message is love. And, but there wasn't really, you know, we didn't go regularly, you know, at all. And, and I speak in a lot of churches, but my, my religion is life, so to speak. It is coming back to life, because that, to me, in my world, God is a verb. God is beingness itself. It's not a thing. And I am sitting here looking out at this gorgeous dogwood tree that is just a waterfall of of orange and red and little tiny bits of green leaves still left from the fall. And that, to me, is God. And a bird just flew through. And so if anything uh, is my religion, it's life itself. Mm. Beautiful. So let me ask you, for people who are not familiar with uh, your work, about the title of your book. I mean, what do you mean? Uh-huh. What do you mean by what is in the way is the way? Ah, uh, great question, Mark. So I want to just share a little bit about the metaphor at the beginning of the book, because people will begin to understand from that what that means. So imagine the most beautiful meta. And, you know, of course, I live here in the Northwest, and, and I, you know, have backed back many times up at Mount Rainier, and it's just one of the true loves of my life. And just imagine this most gorgeous meadow with, you know, a little flowing stream and, you know, little marmots, you know, all around and beautiful flowers and bees buzzing and, and uh, you know, these wonderful noble firs and then the, the mountain, you know, there is the backdrop. Everything flows in that meadow. There's nothing in that meadow that resists life, including pain, death, and loss. We lived in that meadow when we were very young. In fact, we were born out of that meadow, and we lived there there was a time there was no thoughts in our head. I know it's hard to imagine that. But there was a time there was no thoughts in our head. So we were at one with life. But it seems that we have to, uh, that this is a schoolroom, and we have to take on some of the unconsciousness that seems to be our job. And so slowly and surely the clouds that used to pass through the sky, they lower and they lower and they lower. And pretty soon they start whirling and swirling around us until we can't see the meadow anymore. Now, these clouds are all the conditioning that that the basis of it was pretty well formed inside of us before we were six. And we absorbed it, this unconscious self from our parents, that absorbed it from their parents, and so on and so forth. The most important thing to get is you've never left the meadow. You just think you have. 
so when you begin to hear, like I did, you know, about enlightenment, oh my God, I'm going to go back to the meadow, you know, I'm going to be enlightened. And so now I am a seeker. And as long as you're seeking, you will never really truly see the meadow. And I learned somewhere along the line that the peace and the joy that I had been searching for my whole life was already here. And that how you come back to a recognition of the meadow is to get to know your cloud bank, which is made out of fear, glued together with judgment, takes us into anger, irritation, pushing, and the other opposite, despair. And so when I say what's in the way is the way, what I'm basically saying is life is for life. And life has given us this unconscious self as our teacher of awakening. And rather than try to get someplace, you begin to learn how to see and be with the core constructs of your cloud bank. So I lived in a tremendous amount of dread. It's part of the reason why I tried to kill myself so many times. It's a horrible feeling. It's a feeling deep in your core of something really bad is going to happen, and it's going to happen because you screwed up. And I tried to fix it. I tried to get rid of it. I tried to kill myself to get away from it. And then with a combination of learning curiosity and then the wisdom of the heart from Stephen Levine, I started learning how to turn towards. And yes, it took time. Dread was a very scary state. But slowly and surely, I discovered how to be with the dread, which is what it wanted my whole life, rather than fall into it or run away from it. And I learned the alchemy, the process of alchemy, which is the process of turning unconsciousness into consciousness through the power of of my own attentive heart. Now, one other piece to this. What's in the way is the way. There was this wonderful statement that showed up all in one piece as I was writing this book, or, or how I like to say, as the book was being written through me. Life is set up to bring up what has been bound up. So it can open up to be freed up so you can show up for life. We don't see this when we're caught in the unconscious, resisting, fixing, changing, rearranging, wanting what is not here, not wanting what is self. We don't see how intelligent life is. We don't see that life is giving us the exact set of experiences that we need in order to see our fear, to see our despair, to see our loneliness, to see our shame, to see our anger, so that we can learn how to unhook from it just by the act of seeing. Mm -hmm. So I trust life. I trust life implicitly. I don't always like it, but I trust it. I'd like to ask you a question about this is this has something to do with semantics and it's something that I'm always curious about when you say or another teachers say that life happens for us and that what is happening is for the best there's a a devil's advocate that comes up in me that thinks that it sounds like we're making up a story about the best that we can do with what is in other words when people say that what's happening is for the best, to me, that's a story. As instead of saying that what's happening is what's happening, and then we, yeah. do, we do the best we can with it, we learn to respond skillfully to it. It sounds like a fairy tale to me that everything is for the best. And this just may be a semantic difference. Right, right. Yeah. So 
two things very important. Number one, we are a part of a highly, highly intelligent process. It is a process that has taken something as insubstantial as stardust and has created dolphins and uh, meadows full of flowers and ladybugs and human beings and death, destruction, loss. But it's, it's stardust, for heaven's sakes. Let's bring it a little bit closer to home. You were once one cell that was so tiny you couldn't even see it with the naked eye. And it developed, and it knew how to develop, into 70 trillion cells. And they all work together a hell of a lot better than the 7 billion people on our planet. When was the last time we healed the cut on our skin or regulate our temperature or digested our food? Now, to that, we add the yin and yang symbol, which is, to me, one of the most important symbols on this planet. That we have gotten caught in what I call this dualistic mind. If you watch very carefully, the unconscious mind, the thing that talks all day long and likes this and doesn't like that and wants this and doesn't want that and it says, oh, I think I'm going to have an ice cream cone and then five minutes later it says, you shouldn't have done that. <laughs> That's the dualistic mind. And the dualistic mind, if it would create its symbol, it would be, there would be a line down the middle and on one side there would be darkness and on one side there's light. But thank God that didn't become this very, very important symbol called the yin and yang symbol, where dark and light are nestled together. And in the dark is a point of light. And in the light is a point of dark. It's something that we're beginning to grow into now as a species. And that is the understanding that whatever that is, that we call God or the divine or the sacred or whatever, is both dark and light. And there is intelligence in both. There is intelligence in the dark. So when I say life is for us, I, and like I said earlier, I don't always like it, you know, and, and I think that having it be set up this way is a little bit crazy, but this is what we find ourselves in. And when I say life is for us, I mean that life puts us in the exact set of situations that bring up our unconscious self. So when I say life is for us, if you look at evolution, you'll see life is for life. It is always uh, supporting the ongoing unfolding of life. And in my world, well, it's John Salk that basically said that, uh, you know, for you know, millions and millions of years, evolution has been in, you know, uh, biology. Before that, it was molecular. Now, it's in consciousness. So in my world, life is putting us in situations so more and more of us can begin to see and relate to the unconscious self rather than from it. And that is what is going to heal the world. So does that touch on your question? Yes. No, that's actually very beautifully put. And, 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 and uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Right. Let me ask you now about the storyteller. Uh, can you say more about, you know, we're, we're called homo narens, you know, we're the storytelling ape. Uh, it, it, I, it is second nature to us. Uh, yeah. I don't I don't think you're talking about stories of that of the no, sort of no, ex, no. external no, no, no. fictions that we yeah. some of some of which can be useful to, you know, as allegories to oh, live by. Yeah. 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 Well, I love what Deepak Chopra says. We have 65,000 thoughts a day. <laughs> <laughs> when I say that, it makes me a little tired, you know, <laughs> 65,000 thoughts a day. And then he adds, most of them are repeats from the day before. So at one time, there were no stories in our head. And slowly and surely, 
in that process from zero to six, we created a self-image. We got the basic view of ourselves and of life for the first six years of our life. Yeah, we remodel it as we get older, but the basic foundation of it is there. And the key word there is image. It's not the real thing. We pulled ourselves up and out of our bodies and we got stuck in this mental world. That's where most people live. They, their life is experienced as a thought or as many thoughts. And I love what Alan Watts, the great Zen philosopher, once said, no matter how many times you say the word water, it will never be wet. <laughs> I love this. Yeah, so it's so important to get that we've been kind of captured into a mental world. The way I like to describe it is just imagine the most beautiful house with the most beautiful gardens you could ever imagine and windows open and light pouring in. And we live in a basement windowless room mm. with a big screen TV. Mm. So mm. what we do is we think all day long. We're caught in this mental world. And if you had a door, uh, a doorway on your forehead, you could open up and you would see that the stories that go through your head all day long, you're telling yourself stories about life, about your mate, about your health, about the future, about the past, about how you're doing it right, how you're doing it wrong, you know, and... Uh, and you begin to see, oh, my God, I just think about my life. Now, really important thing that happened as I was writing my latest book, What's in the Way is the Way, is I began to realize that when we were very young, we took on eight core spells that if people are interested in that, they can just email us at awaken at mariomalley.com and it's in what's in the way is the way, but uh, but I can send them the list of spells. And my group spent uh, you know a year. Uh, I I created the eight core spells, and then we talked about them a lot and about how the different ways people would say this particular spell, and people really began to be able to relate more and more to the stories in their head because they began to realize that most all of it is spells that you took on when you were young. Mm. And the reason why the word spell is so powerful is because it's something that's laid over the top of you. It's not true. And it can be lifted. Mm. Now, so important to say here, we're not putting the mind down. Oh my God, it only took the universe 13.8 billion years to figure out how to make it. But we need to learn how to use it for the exquisite tool it is, rather than allowing it to take over our life and think it is the master. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. I was just going to ask you about the spells. Can you, can you list the spells? Yeah. The first core spell. And these are spells I, oh God, Mark, I've had the grace for 30 years now to see into the minds and hearts of tens of thousands of people. And to see people, I've worked all the way from mentally challenged people to homeless people to presidents of, of corporations to therapists to, you know, uh, homemakers to, you name it, you know, all, all walks of life. And this started coming about four years ago. All of a sudden, it just started showing up in my head. Oh, my God. All of this stuff could be distilled down into eight core spells that we took on. And keep on remembering spells are something that's not true. Before I go into the spells, I want to just say one other thing. There is a wonderful book called The Proof of Heaven by Evan Alexander. And he is a neuroscientist at Harvard who had a uh, near-death experience. He got uh, spinal meningitis and was in a coma for uh, seven days and uh, saw things when he was out of his body and came back and wrote this book. 
and he does not like the title. He said, there's no proof, and I don't use the word heaven. <laughs> but he basically said, heaven is right here. It's not a place. It's right here, and we don't see it. And I say we don't see it because of the spells. The spells are like the cloud bank, okay? So first course spell, we're born. We are absolutely at one with our mother, and somewhere in those first few months, we get the first glimmerings that I am a separate being. Mm -hmm. That's not true. Well, on some level, it is true. You know, like I can reach out and touch you. But at the deep, true level, that is not true. You are not separate from anything. In my retreats, we do this wonderful food meditation that shows you that it took the whole universe mm -hmm. to uh, conspire together to bring this strawberry to you. So that's the first spell. The second spell, as from the flow, from this recognition that we are part of this flow, and as Evan said, when he was pressed, if could you put into words what you saw? And he said, you can't put it into words. But the closest I could come is, love is the reality of all realities. The incomprehensibly wondrous truth that lives at the heart of everything that has ever existed or ever will exist. So in my world, I look out at this beautiful dogwood tree, and I see leaves, yes, but I also see the expression of love. When we take on the second spell, I, life is not safe. Mm -hmm. We shut down that connection with life, with love. Those are the core Two spells. Then we go into the three operating spells. I have to control life. I've got to do it. And we leave this wondrous realm of being that we knew when we were young. So that's the first one. I have to control life. I have to do it. Second one, I got to do it right. Third one, I'm not doing it good enough or right enough. Mm. And if you open that little door on a person's forehead and was able to listen to what they were talking to themselves about all day long and not really even being aware of it, you'll see they live mainly in those three spells. I got to do it. I got to do it right. And then not doing it right enough. Then that leads to the hidden spells. And I am saying from my experience of 30 years, we all have these hidden spells, and most people don't ever allow themselves to become aware of it. Maybe in the middle of the night when their relationship is ended or their boss has fired them or whatever, they'll wake up and these spells come roaring up from the depth, and they just hit you like a tsunami wave, and you don't want to live anymore. And the three core hidden spells are, because I am not doing it right, uh, I am wrong. Mm -hmm. And I oftentimes say bad and wrong, and those two are a little bit different. I am bad and wrong. Because I am bad and wrong, I am unlovable. And this is the, the we are connectors. We, we are love reaching out to love and most people feel themselves as being unlovable and then it comes to the core spell I am all alone but the amazing thing is if you take that word alone and you separate it out it's all one that is just a spell that is the core spell that caused us to separate out and live in so much suffering. And all the while, we are loved more than we can possibly know. 
by the the sun, the moon, the stars, the pavement, the air, the whatever. We are a sea of love, and we just don't see it because we are caught in this cloud bank of spells Mm. that put a veil between us and what is really going on here. Beautiful, beautiful. Wow, it's it's such a wonderful teaching. Tell tell me, Mary, what is the role of of activism and service uh, in in your system of teaching? Activism mostly comes from something is wrong out there and I have to fix it. And it was Einstein that said, if you try to solve a problem at the same level that you created it, that it was created, you only create more problems. As more and more of us begin to see, to recognize the yin and yang symbol, to recognize there's nothing that needs to be fixed, changed, or rearranged, that that is your foundation, that life is for life and it knows what it's doing, then you can respond to situations. This is where people get really uh, kind of messed up. They think that it sounds like if you think life is for you and life knows what it's doing, you're supposed to sit down by the side of the road. That's just a dualistic thought. It says, oh, i got to get out there and change things. You're saying, I don't have to do that, so you go to the office. I don't have to do anything. It's something in the middle. It's more and more people learning how to respond to life from the wisdom of the gut brain and the heart brain rather than react to it. And that, to me, is the greatest service of all that the greatest service is more and more people clearing through their cloud bank so they can begin to live from the heart, which is the main brain. Science is showing us now the heart and the gut. Those are amazing brains that got cut off when we were very young. And so to me, by far, the greatest service is people in their life here for life, seeing it through the eyes of the heart, which is seeing it through the heart of life. So, for example, when I go into a grocery store, usually I'm the only one that is there, really there. Every once in a while, I'll meet somebody that's really there, and it's just wonderful, you know. (laughs) But most of the people are completely caught in their cloud banks. So to me, one of the greatest service you can do is to connect in love. And so I just wander around. I know of all the 7 billion people on the planet, there's no accident who's in that store with me. And I just see them. And I see them with my heart. And when I go check out, I am there as fully as I can with that grocery store clerk because he or she is a unique and necessary aspect of the divine. Now, I want to add one other thing. The greatest service is learning how to meet yourself in your heart. That's so much about what's in the way is the way is all about. This whole, you know, all my books and CDs and retreats and and everything because it's when you can become whole inside of you, when you can weave the dark and the light. And remember, you know, I tried to kill myself because I was such a worthless piece of crud that I didn't even deserve how to live. And now every single part of myself is woven in my heart. And because of that, there's very little that I have to react to out there so I can keep my heart open to whatever shows up in my life. And in my world, that is what will heal our world, one person at a time. Mm. Great. Uh, Just a couple more questions. You say that there's nothing wrong in the world, uh, and yet obviously there's an enormous amount of suffering. Exactly. So when yes. you when you turn on the news and you see mm-hmm. children being 
kidnapped or people being beheaded. Right, exactly. What do you feel? Yeah. What do you feel? Yeah, my heart aches, but it doesn't break. There is a, I had the very good grace to hang out with uh, Brian Swim, uh, this wonderful, wonderful human being. He's the, and I won't ever say it right, he's now the director for the, Center for the Study of Science and Spirituality in uh, uh, Berkeley, and he's written many books, and he's a scientist, and he hung out with a wonderful uh, priest called Thomas Berry. And I was with them many years ago uh, in the 80s, and they did this wonderful thing, and they took uh, uh, many uh, stages of evolution, and they showed how life is a story, and it's a constantly evolving story. And they showed how one play, one phase ends, and the new phase comes in. There's always chaos, always chaos, as the old is dying and the new is being born. Uh, in fact, Elizabeth Satoris, the wonderful evolutionary biologist, has a twist on the butterfly story. She said, here is this exquisitely beautiful uh, being that came from a caterpillar that was a taker. The caterpillar just takes and takes and takes and eats and eats and eats, and then he you know, wraps himself up in a cocoon. And in that cocoon, the caterpillar turns to goo. And what they say is out of the goo comes what they call imaginal cells. It just gives me a chill whenever I say that. This is the forerunner of the butterfly. The goo, the old, always kills this first wave of imaginal cells. And it causes these cells to come together into a community and the urge to the new overcomes the old and out comes this butterfly that is the complete opposite of the caterpillar. It has this view that it can, you know, this view isn't one you know, branch of one tree. It can fly, the monarchs can fly from Canada to Mexico for heaven's sakes and they pollinate. So when I see all that, my heart aches. But it doesn't break because I know we are in an evolutionary shift and we are in that shift of the dualistic mind being what is in charge. And all you have to do is look at the evening news to see that that is what is happening to the heart brain being in charge. And so I feel, I feel sadness, but I also know birth is messy and you know, if you went into, if you were an alien from another planet and you went into a, the birthing room of a female that was yelling her head off and, you know, and there was blood and pee and poop and all this stuff everywhere, you know, you think, oh my God, what's happening? Somebody's dying. But if you knew that it was a birth, you would celebrate it. So that's what I invite people to do, to allow your heart to ache to allow that to inspire you more to see those aspects inside of you, because we are the universe, that you see out there in the world. That's how we'll heal the world, is to heal them inside of us. And people say this allows them to stay spacious around what is happening rather than becoming a part of what is happening by falling into fear and despair. Mary O'Malley, thank you so much for this eloquent and beautiful interview. I, I was, it's been amazing spending time with you. Thank you so much. I so appreciate you getting this message more out into the world. And, of course, they can go to maryomalley.com if they want to know more about how they can heal the world. And if they're interested, they can email me also, and I will send them the last chapter of What's in the Way is the Way, which brings it all together that we truly are in a breakthrough time. It looks like a breakdown time. But in my world, it's a breakthrough time. Gorgeous. Thank you, Mary. Thank you, Mark. For more information about Mark's work, join his community at www.markmatusic.com to receive his monthly open book newsletter and learn more about the digital products and autoresponder email courses offered by Mark Matusik Media. To connect with Mark online, visit his site, markmatusic.com.